Ladies and gentlemen, it's our greatest pleasure to welcome you at first Polish Asian Gallery. The event is organized by the University of Warsaw and is part of Bridge to Asia project, which is funded by National Agency for Academic Exchange. Polish Asian gatherings at the University of Warsaw are meetings of representatives of academia, business and governmental institutions. Our aim uh, is to foster knowledge about Asia, build a network between experts, as well as transfer knowledge from academia to business. We are honored that you have accepted our invitation and then that we are capable of host representatives of each group, including former ambassador of the uh, of Republic of Poland, Tadeusz Konicki. Uh, representatives of People's Republic of China Embassy in Warsaw. Polish Investment and Trade Agency. Central Communication Port of Republic of Poland, uh, P PwC, and of course our core group, University of Warsaw, and other universities, lecturers, and students. And of course our keynote speakers, Mr. Jakub Jakubowski and Dr. Konrad Popowski from Center for Eastern Studies. Mr. Jakub Jakubowski is Senior Research Fellow at China Research Program and PhD candidate at Warsaw School of Economics. And Dr. Konrad Popławski is a Senior Fellow at the Department for Germany and Northern Europe and recently re received his PhD, PhD degree at Warsaw School of Economics. Today's topic of Polish Asian Gathering is the Silk Railroad. Poland as a major hub for the EU rail connections. The presentation will be followed by discussion. Um, the organizing team consists of Ms. Paulina Uznańska, the coordinator of Polish Asian Gatherings, uh, Dr. Piotr Grzebyk, head of Polish Research Center for Law and Economy of China, Ms. Katarzyna Kaptur, expert of Polish Research Center for Law and Economy of China, and myself, Maximilian Piekut, uh, Bridge to Asia project manager. Now we would like to ask Dr. Piotr Grzebyk to officially open our meeting. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. Good afternoon, thank you all for coming. Um, it's my particular pleasure to host you today. Starting from today, on a regular basis, every two months, we will be inviting you to join us participate in lectures, kind of a small seminars, and we'll invite you to share your opinions and comments on problems and issues discussed during these kind of meetings. The idea of the Polish Asian gathering is as simple as that. Every time we start with a small lecture, we will, uh, which will be delivered by one or maximum two distinguished uh, guests who are, as we know, experts in their fields. Then the lecture will be followed by a Q&A session and we will end up with a small reception during which we can have a nice conversation on Asia issues. So this kind of meetings are part of a Polish Research Center a strategy to build up a hub kind of a cluster or simple a place where an expert on China, Asia may meet and have a platform for exchange ideas about challenges we face in this region. So um, I'm very happy to have you here tonight. I wish you a fruitful discussion. My colleagues, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to initiate this uh, formula of uh, Polish Asian gatherings. And um, today we are going to talk about the, the Silk Railroad, which is a term that we actually coined ourselves, and which is a link to a project that we conducted for more than a year. And its aim was to be to, 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 to research and to present an overview of what's going on uh, in the sector of the EU-China railway connections. So, uh, as you can see, the Silk Railroad is like 
that the term is closely linked to the Silk Road or, or One Belt, One Road initiative. But I will we'll try to focus on rather the, the, the practical business side of it than the great geopolitical framework as the Belt and Road initiative is presented. And that was the idea behind the project. So in, instead of, uh, okay, we did an extensive analysis of official documents and, and discourse, but uh, our method was based on uh, talks and research with the people on site, on the ground. So together with Konrad here, we traveled throughout Poland, Central Europe, Germany, and China, and talked with logistics people, forwarders, uh, cargo terminal operators. We, we, we first, we kind of accumulated knowledge about the trains, which are, by the way, very interesting. <laughs> but, uh, th and then we, we, our aim was that to translate this very technical knowledge into policy recommendations and the, the general overview that's hopefully understandable for everyone. So uh, the, 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 the report is here and uh, you can also find it on our website. It's both in English and Polish. Here are some copies uh, for you to, to, to take and please feel invited to, to do this. Uh, the project is rather about the, the general overview, but here we're going to add a specific Polish perspective and uh, try to, to stimulate a discussion on the Poland's role in it. Uh, so the, the, the general content of the presentation consists of five parts. I'm not going to go through all of them, but the, the first one is a myth uh, that we would like to talk about, maybe not a myth, maybe it's kind of like a, a, a bit of over-exaggeration. Of course, China is very important throughout the process, but what's crucial for, for uh, we think, for everybody to understand is that China is not the only player here. And uh, it can be stated that without a number of different actors, business actors, representatives of governments throughout the whole Eurasia, this whole project will not be possible. And uh, while China is a key driver, I'm going, we're going to elaborate on that and why China is important here. It's very important to, to understand that if we are, as Poland, to think of ourselves as a hub or, or a place that's important for this whole uh, project, we need to take a bunch of other action, actors into considerations, in, in, including multinational companies from the US, from Korea, Japan, Germany, and also uh, governments along the route going far east to, to China, because without a, a, this, this genuine and profound international cooperation, uh, it's, it's practically impossible to, to, to shape the, the process, that it will include our interests and bring benefits to us. So, uh, very briefly about the, uh, who created the Silk Railroad. Well, uh, it's actually, it's, it's a good intuition to look at it as a thing that was kind of like, maybe not initiated, but greatly supported by the Belt and Road Initiative. So it was established in 2013 with Xi Jinping's speech in, in Kazakhstan and later on in Indonesia, which, which gave a, a broad political vision that kind of inspired all of these actors we are talking about, and also uh, gave a great incentive to Chinese provinces, which you'll find out are crucial in this whole process. And I think it's, uh, it, we, we, we could say that the provinces are even more important than Beijing itself. <laughs> and I'll try to, to, to describe these dynamics between Beijing and the center that wants to coordinate this thing, and provinces which are funding it, which are coordinating it, and which are competing within this great process. Uh, but apart from the provinces, there is the European logistics sector, which was, by the way, the, the initial 
founder of this whole thing because the 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 the, the roots the the fundament the, the first trials of this eu china trains were conducted even before the belt and road initiative and they were conducted by the, the european mostly german but also american logistics sector that set up the fundaments that talked to all of those people along the road to facilitate this whole thing, this EU-China block train connections. And only then the great vision arrived that kind of like ignited the whole thing. Yeah, but without this international cooperation, including not only transnational corporations, but also governments, local governments, and so on, this thing will not be possible. And I think that the, 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 the main point we'd like to, to, to present here is that Although we tend to look at the building road as a great geopolitical, but most of all political agenda that is to shape Eurasia and so on, that, that, that may be true, but building road is much, much more than this particular thing. And this particular thing, although it's very, that's very important for building road, for Beijing and so on, this is one of the things that is least Chinese, I would say, <laughs> out of all the projects about Belt and Road because of the involvement of those very different actors. So in, in this regard, the project is not political. Yeah, it's more like, like business oriented. Uh, nevertheless, the political conditions were crucial uh, for its development, and I'll try to very briefly go through that. So uh, as I said, the the the, the key structural factor that pushed this initiative forward was the involvement of Chinese provinces. So uh, since early 2000s, a lot of the Chinese industry and especially foreign investors in China moved to Western China, including Sichuan, Chongqing, and so on, because of the most, more competitive uh, wages, because of, you know, most of you are perfectly aware of what was going on at the time in China. But uh, one of the key obstacles for those inland provinces to flourish and develop was the issue of logistics. So the, 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 the sea, uh, the, the, the provinces adjacent to the sea in China have a perfect access to, to, to the world oceans. And that was crucial for them to develop their pro-export sector. But for inland provinces, going to these ports, the Chinese ports of Shanghai, Ningbo, you name it, that was an obstacle because there, the goods that were produced in inland provinces needed to travel at least a thousand, couple of hundred kilometers through a very congested Chinese railway and, and road network to re only to reach uh, uh, the ports in, in a week or sometimes two weeks, and it was costly. So the idea on the behalf of the provinces was that to establish a better connection to the world markets, and that's most of all to the European Union, by setting up these train connections. And on the other side, the main partner for those provinces at the time, we're talking about the year 2008, 2010, the main partner were the multinationals, and particular two companies, the, the American Dell, Corporation, which had a plant in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in Chinese inland provinces, and also German automotive makers, which formed kind of a partnership with Sichuan, uh, Chengdu, and Chongqing to set up these first connections. Yeah, but the underlying structural factor for for those trade flows were was the the, the growing economic and political ties between EU and China, and in particular Germany and China. And Germany is a very important actor here. My, my colleague will, will elaborate on that. But without global corporations that had production facilities in inland Chinese provinces and other assembly facilities in Europe, these trade flows will never occur and these, these trains will run empty. So there were the, the key, like on the business side, there were the key players here and, and are still the key players here. And more and more, multinational corporations that are present in China and produce a range of different electronic, automotive, and so on uh, products, they, they, 
to increasingly use this new logistical solution to, to be competitive, to stay competitive. And uh, that's a very important thing. But kind of simultaneously, there was another very profound development in, in Eurasia, which was the establishment of the Eurasian Economic Union that, that groups Russia, Kazakhstan, and Belarus in a bunch of small countries, but these three countries are most important now because with this uh, tariff, uh, new tariff area came an increased cooperation among railways, national rail operators. Of course, the, 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 the tariff borders within this grouping disappeared, and this created a very, very good uh, environment for transnational cross-border flow of goods, including uh, trains, yeah, cargo trains. So this was very, very important and still is. And because of that, Russia, Kazakhstan, and Belarus are very important actors here. And they are basically crucial for this thing to operate. And uh, uh, from the point of view of those countries, these new trade flows going from China to EU, yeah, these two big markets, from their point of view, this, these new trade flows presented in a unique developmental opportunity. For, take, for example, the Kazakhstan, which was, is still is like the, the, the oil and uh, based economy, and they want to, uh, to, to foster new sectors, including the logistics, and they are at the gateway coming from Western China towards Europe. So the, 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 the Kazakhstan found out that there's a great opportunity here to, to earn money, to, to support this growing logistics sector by uh, forming, by building new infrastructure, providing good regulatory framework, and so on. So these countries are very much involved in that, and I'll try to very briefly go through that to, 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 to show you how these countries along the route try to shape this whole process. You know, by providing good developing transport corridors, providing good regulatory frameworks, investing in infrastructure, those countries, including Kazakhstan, Belarus, South Caucasus countries, and even Iran, try to you know, attract these trade flows. Yeah? So very introductory in a way, but uh, it needs to be understood that there are a lot of interests there. And, uh, We'll talk about the main interests, including China and Germany and Russia, but there's a lot of different state actors here that also want to be part of it. And uh, I think Poland is and should be one of them. So uh, I, this is a very, very complicated slide because this whole process is very complicated and each you know, image there represents a process that needs to be done here. Uh, we, we don't have much time to go through that, but there's one thing I, I'd like you to remember is that if we're talking the, the, about the, the Chinese trains going from China to Europe, that doesn't mean that any train goes from China and ends at Euro in Europe. Because if that's not possible, because of different standards of the infrastructure, different the regulatory frameworks, and because of that, in order for any train to go from China to Europe and vice versa, uh, I think tens of different types of companies, most of them local, needs to be involved. So in China, we have uh, like shipments and warehousing, you know, operating, collecting all of those goods in Chinese terminals. Uh, but then they are transported by Chinese railways to the Chinese Kazakh border. And then the, the gouge of the railway, which is much wider in the former Soviet Union than in China and in Europe, because of this, this difference, the, the train carriages needs to be need to be changed, and the locomotives needs to be changed, and you need local operators to do that. And then you have national railway operators that transport these goods, and you have local customs clearance companies that help to facilitate that, and so on. And it happens again in Russia because of different like, like railway uh, standards, and then in Belarus, and then in Poland, and then in Germany. And on top of that, you know, on technical side, you need all of those different companies, you know, to run this train. But in order to put goods on this train, you, you need another bunch of companies there, like forwarders, 
global forwarders that, for example, have clients in China that produce electronics and ship them throughout the world. And they're cooperating with, I know, DHL or DB Schenker or FedEx or you name it, sometimes local companies, sometimes global companies. But the whole process, you know, to arrange this, to, to, to deliver those goods to the terminals, to bring them back, to distribute them, this is a very complicated process. And you need a lot of know-how to do this. And uh, although I assume that, that the Chinese, which are by the funding in a way this whole process, would like to be a part of it, but they certainly lack a lot of this knowledge. So as a result, in order to, to move these goods from point A in China to point B in Europe and vice versa, you need like at least you know, six or seven different nationalities and tens of different companies that need to coordinate, and only then the, 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 the goods are transported. And each of those companies and each of those countries have their own interest in that. <laughs> and they want to shape the process in order to gain more benefits out of it, because some of, some of those processes are more profitable and some are less. And uh, my colleague here will you know, present to you uh, which are the most profitable or which are less profitable. So. Um, this is the, the map. There are, there's a number of different corridors linking China and, and Europe. But as for now, this is the only corridor that works. I mean, in a large scale, in a business scale. So it leaves China either straight to Russia in the Far East or through Mongolia or through Kazakhstan. And this third, third route through Kazakhstan is the, the most important now. About 70% of trains are running through Kazakhstan. Nevertheless, they all meet up around Ural in Russia and then are transported through Moscow and then Belarus. And then within this, this green circle there on the Polish-Belarus border. And as for now, this corridor is the only viable corridor. There is a number of attempts to develop alternative routes for a number of different reasons because other countries want to, to profit, to, to earn money out of it. But those countries here, starting in Germany, Poland, Belarus, Russia, Kazakhstan, China, and Mongolia, the, the, you know, the depth of cooperation between those countries is so developed and extensive now that if you want to run a train, it's much, much easier faster and cheaper to use this corridor because all of those companies already have you know a harmonized regulatory frameworks they have good business connections amongst each other so this gives a tremendous advantage to to this corridor here uh, one one important question is because but one point point because it's it's a political point this this red circle there so the, the red circle at the Russian-Ukrainian border is where the Russian and Ukrainian railway networks meet. And this route can be possibly used to transport goods into Europe through Ukraine and then southern Poland or Slovakia and Hungary. But it's not working. And why it's not working? <laughs> you, you can imagine, you, you, can, you can probably, you know, probably know the answer already. It's because the, the war between Ukraine and, and Russia which is not only a, a uh, like hot military conflict, but also an economic conflict. And in 2014, Russia basically banned any cargo trains that could run from Ukraine to Asia generally. For Ukraine, the, the transport, railway transport to Kazakhstan were the most important because this, is, this used to be an important export market for Ukraine, but it also now includes the EU-China railways. And as long as this conflict between Russia and Ukraine lasts, uh, the, the, the transport through Ukraine is basically blocked. And this really, in a way, you know, indirectly supports this Belarusian-Polish link because it's the only viable link now. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, there, there are possibly other routes going through Baltic states, and then you know these goods are to be transshipped to Baltic Sea, and then through ships going to the Western European ports. But as for now, these are only pilot projects, because 
it's costly and it, it's time consuming. And if you, on one hand, have an option to go straight through Belarus and Poland to Europe, you know, with one gauge change, but basically very easy. And on the other hand, you go to the Baltic port, you transship in the in ferries or, or ships and then go through a port and unload it. It takes time and it's costly and it's not competitive now. So I would say if you ask, you know, port operators in the Baltics, which are constantly telling everybody that it's feasible, but if you ask them, you know, personally, they will most likely tell you that it's not profitable. <laughs> okay, there are, there's a bunch of other corridors. Okay, these, those are all possible corridors that, you know, the, the, the Chinese put in their strategies and all corridors along which the local countries want to, to develop these trade flows. So there's one, the, the red one going through Central Asia, Caspian Sea, South Caucasus, and then Black Sea to, to, to Romania and Bulgaria and Ukraine. There are attempts, but it's not a massive corridor and it's not used massively. South Caucasian states, especially Azerbaijan, and also Kazakhstan are involved in that. Also Poland is involved in that because, you know, it's maybe it's not very feasible economically, but it has a very important advantage of not going through Russia. <laughs> and uh, my colleague will explain to you, Russia is using its position to block some kinds of trade flows to inflict you know, political pressure on countries like Ukraine, but also Poland and other EU countries. So one certain advantage of this Trans-Caspian Corridor is to avoid this politicized China, uh, Russian route. Yeah, politicized, but also more developed. There are also other, like the, the yellow one going through Central Asia and Iran and Turkey, but it's a very long-term plan because the, you know, the, 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 the level of cooperation between those countries is very low in terms of you know, unified standards and so on. The state of infrastructure is also very, very low. It's, it's, it, it needs a lot of investments, and for us for now, it's not feasible. There are some trains running to Turkey, but not to Europe, yeah. So uh, basically that's how it, look, uh, it looks, and uh, the most important uh, thing here is that if we are talking about EU-China relations connections, we are talking about this green silk circle here. And without this green circle, this whole thing is not you know, economically feasible as for now. And it gives a great advantage to Poland. Okay, uh, I'll, try, I'll try to describe uh, why actually this project is working because we described already some political uh, conditions for this project, but uh, politics is not enough to make such projects smooth. We need some demands, some supply and some business logic to work uh, smoothly. And, and how well this project works, this show, it shows this graph. Actually, we see that uh, in a time frame of eight to nine years, the project developed actually practically from none to quite quite big and substantial amount of trains going uh, from China to to the EU and uh, away away back. And uh, actually, this is very interesting because the most the quite optimistic calculations as, as, and, and, and estimations of the Chinese government, uh, they predicted that, that, there, that there could be 5,000 trains going uh, in one, one, and, uh, one way and one way back in 2020. And actually, as we see on this graph, in 2018, we are already well above the uh, estimations. And just short notice, uh, the number for 2018 is not sure. It could be a little lower because we have just the preliminary calculations. Uh, so probably it's uh, a little lower, but it's still a great success because nobody expected that it could develop so fast. Uh, but uh, it's, it's important to remember that uh, this train way 
is not a substitute for uh, for for C. Uh, there are sometimes uh, some great geopolitical visions uh, uh, described that actually uh, land land connection could be a substitution for. Uh, for sea or ocean connection. Actually, it, it won't be true a long time, probably never, because, because actually train and sea connection, it's, they are, those are two different products. Uh, and sea has great advantage over train because of costs, but, but train is very good when it comes to time. And some, for some goods, t- time is really uh, important and, and and that's why we we estimate for, for for now that train already has quite uh, uh, interesting share. It's up. It's between two, but probably closer to nine percent of the whole trade uh, between China and the EU. But uh, and uh, and this is mostly a high value train. So the goods which are transported by train are mostly middle to high value because because you have to pay more for transport but it's worth it so we assess that it's it could be up to 45 billion uh, US dollars year annually transported uh, by train connection I mean, we mean now yeah these are estimations but we're yeah. talking about 2018 yeah, yeah not about future mm-hmm. and uh, it's interesting to show you some example how, how actually this connection works. So imagine with that we have one container of goods worth one million U.S. dollars. It could be abstract, but uh, to be honest, it's, for example, one container of not very modern laptops because very good laptops, it could be worth, the container of very good laptops could be worth even 10 million of U.S. dollars. And if we analyze the time of de- delivery, it's, let's say, 20 days for train and 50 days for ship. And this is, let's say, some average connection. Yeah, let's say uh, Chengdu to uh, Chongqing to Duisburg, but and it costs much. Uh, the, the cost for train is two and uh, two and a half times higher than for ships. So let, let's say it's five thousand uh, dollars per container and two thousand for ship. Of course, those 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 calculations, the, these calculations can change during the year because. Especially the ship connections are very, uh, very variable. The, the prices of those connections they change a lot during the year or from year uh, on year basis. But if you if we calculate cost of capital because the goods uh, which are on board of the, of the of the of the of the of the ship they are actually frozen. Company has to pay for those goods or take some credits to finance those goods. And, and, and you, have, you have to wait, for example, 50 days to get, to get those money unleashed. So that's why uh, how cost of capital have to be taken into account. And if you, if, you, if you take into account cost of capital for such container of goods of uh, middle quality, middle price, it, it turns out that this calculation is conducive for, ship tra- for, for train transport. And what kind of industri- industries could use such connection? As we analyzed it so far, uh, it's, it's actually a very uh, conducive way of transport for automobile sector, uh, followed by uh, machinery, electronics, IT, and uh, fast-moving consumer goods sector. So those are the branches which use the connections the most, but uh, there are also some other uh, industries, uh, for example, to the lesser extent, the connection is, is used by chemical, uh, household goods, or pharmaceutical uh, industry. And there's also a very interesting case of fashion uh, or, some, or some businesses where time during the year is important. For example, we have Christmas time uh, and we need to very fast uh, satisfy the demand for some goods. And then uh, train connection is very, uh, very conducive because uh, during two or three weeks you can you can have already uh, the goods from from China on shelves in the shops, 
and uh, and uh, uh, by the ships you have to wait one month lo longer. So so this is important for for the goods where the time time is uh, crucial. And uh, one more important uh, aspect of this connection, because before uh, the sea, 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 seaside cities were uh, were preferred because. Uh, logistic is a, is a such sector where, for example, you could you could pay very low cost for transport of five thousand kilometers by ocean from, let's say, Shanghai to Rotterdam. But then you can uh, you can pay double the same price for taking the goods from Rotterdam to some one two hundred kilometer further city or, or three hundred because uh, road transport is is so much more expensive than uh, sea transport. That's why uh, trains are also very useful uh, because uh, they could, uh, they allow to establish a steady connection be between uh, be be between uh, cities which are uh, in in lands. So, for example, uh, if you have, uh, let's say, Chengdu and Warsaw, you just put uh, put put goods on train in Chengdu, transport it to Warsaw, and you have that. Port you have the goods directly by you. You don't have to pay additional costs for the very expensive road transport. So this is also a very important important aspect of this connection. And this is also what is actually the most interesting from this political uh, side is actually what kind of benefits it offered for the what what kind of value added you can uh, you can achieve. Uh, participating in this project, and based on our calculation, 2000, in 2018 the connection generated uh, over one billion US dollars for the countries participating in the project, and this is actually already four times more than it was uh, two years ago. So the development is quite fast. But actually, on what specific you earn those money? So about. 72% of this of this amount comes uh, from uh, excise duties from tariffs because uh, as you probably know the custom duties in the in, in the EU are constructed so that countries could leave some uh, some uh, part of the incomes from excise duties in country because it's a uh, it's it's regulated so that it's actually cost of uh, taking those those excise duties, so that's why uh, it generates a lot a lot of uh, additional uh, additional incomes from countries. S uh, second position is actually additional shipping services. What actually that means? It means those services, as I said before, of uh, of transporting goods from, for example, a train terminal to the end customer and the the the, the smallest the smallest uh, chunk in this in this in this in this calculation is actually about 6% what you can earn on direct shipping services uh, so so those money goes to such companies like uh, PKP or some other railway uh, uh, operators and you can earn about five percent, five percent on uh, on, on uh, granting infrastructure for this project. So actually, uh, to 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 say it more directly, if you would like to get the most of those incomes, you should be a hub and 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 earn money on duties and on uh, offering some uh, some connections uh, for these goods. Okay, we will get back to. The this particular issue uh, in a while, while talking about the, the Polish position here. Uh, but for, as for now, we are the crucial transit country. Yeah, Virtually all of the goods go through Poland, through polish Belarus border now. But as you can see, being a transit country equals to about 10% of this additional value that can be uh, earned we are talking about EU countries here, yeah? We are talking about the EU side, but you know, you, you can uh, provide a similar calculation on the Chinese side, but we're talking about the EU side here. So uh, going forward to the, the main state actors present here, uh, we don't have that much time, so we'll focus 
of on three major actors present here. But as I said, there is a number of different actors there, including these smaller transit countries, hub countries, countries that want to shape these corridors in South Caucasus, Central Asia, and so on. But basically, this whole project runs because of three actors, which are China, of course, Germany, and Russia. Yeah. Uh, so a very quick overview on, on, the, on the goals and interests and so on. So uh, coming back to the, the Chinese issue, I, I started this whole presentation with. Uh, as I said, the, the, the timeline is, is very telling here. The, the, the first trials and the first proof of concept was provided by private companies, multinationals, American, Hewlett Packard, Dell, and German automotive makers were the, 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 the companies that, that invented that. Yeah? Uh, and only then, uh, Xi Jinping uh, provided this grand scheme of Belt and Road Initiative, which, by the way, at the very initial stage, on the level of his speech in Astana in Kazakhstan, the train connections were not present there. Yeah? Because that's how this whole initiative unfolds. So Xi Jinping gave the grand scheme, and then a number of different actors within China started to think about providing some you know, actual deliverables, yeah? some concepts on what this whole thing could mean. You know, the, that's on a, on a technical level, that, that's, that's how, that's how it's, it happened. And uh, I already told you about the provinces there, which are competing to become a hub, because you know not all countries in Europe are fully aware of advantages of being a hub, but that's not true in China. And in China, everybody knows what that means, and that means a lot of money <laughs> and a potential new engine of growth, especially for inland provinces. And uh, of course, you know, this competition among provinces was, is still there on the level of, you know, good regulations and provinces are competing with, you know, you know, providing all kinds of regulations that the businesses need to establish themselves. Also on the level of infrastructure, they want to they build a big, you know, transshipment terminals to, you know, facilitate this, this large flows of goods. I think Chengdu has spent about $2 billion to, be, to build a really big transshipment terminal. Lots of warehousing there. If you look at it, it's nearly as big as Małaszewice in, uh, in Poland, which is a very large terminal. But what, what, what Chengdu built, what Chongqing built, Wuhan and Zhengzhou, those are four crucial province cities yeah, that, that got involved. They invested a lot of money in the hard infrastructure. But the competition is not only based on those two things. And uh, the, the key to, 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 to being competitive on behalf of Chinese provinces were the subsidies. Yeah, so not only they provided good regulatory framework, not only they provided good infrastructure for businesses, they also paid money in order for this business to run. So for those of you, and most of you probably do follow the Chinese economy generally, this is a, a regular pattern of how China does the, the economic development. Yeah? So first comes the government, it provides the platform, it subsidizes, and uh, ideally the business comes and the government withdraws. <laughs> and we all know that it's not working like that always, and there are a lot of sectors where the government is still subsidizing a lot. And this is one of those sectors. But what's important there is the competition within China. And all of those provinces and cities do compete to be the cheapest provider of railway links by subsidizing it. So Conrad has presented you with like $5,000 for a container to be transported from China to Europe. But this price is not, let's say, a market price. You know, probably nobody knows, and we talk with a lot of people in the business, and I would say the consensus among the businesses is that without subsidies, it will cost 
about ten thousand dollars. Yeah, but if you go to any tr you know trade forwarder in Poland or in China, they'll provide you with a lot of different prices. Let's say we we talk with one forwarder in Poland, and he 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 told us something about you know uh, promotions. You know, <laughs> like you say. He said, you know, in November you go to Chengdu and you get a really good price because they have a lot of subsidies. But in a month it, they run out of money, so we move to Wuhan because then you got even cheaper connection there. Because the, this, this, I'll give you an example. So I, I can't quite remember that the, the city. I think it was Zhengzhou. There was this special offer for businesses that. If they use the Zhengzhou terminal, they have a free road transport from any place in China within the 1,500 kilometers radius, only to use their terminal there. So it, it made this whole business very you know, volatile and fluctuating because there are a lot of companies that move from one terminal to another <laughs> because the provinces compete with the prices. Yeah. And uh, generally, this is how it started, and it's largely true up until now. <laughs> and that's why the scale of this whole project, this 6,000 trains a year, is so big. Probably without the subsidies, it will be lower than that. Uh, it go. Yeah. Hmm? It go. Yeah, yeah, it will go. Uh, we made a very basic calculation. So for a, a container of goods worth one, more than $1 million, it's feasible to ship it by rail even without subsidies. So there's a large demand from these high value goods produced mostly by multinationals, yeah? And this will be shipped uh, by train probably no matter if the subsidies are there or not. But there's a lot of you know, lower and mid value goods that are put on the trains only because of those subsidies now. So as I said, the competition was fierce and it was from the point of view of Beijing you know, damaging to the provincial finances. So in 2013 to 15, there was there were attempts by Beijing, and they'll steer it there to make this whole thing coordinated. We can elaborate some more in the Q and A session on how Beijing wants to do that. But the general idea is that there is this Belt and Road so small leading group in the State Council that you know attracts all of important stakeholders in China. And in 2015, the China Railways, the main railway operated, was given the responsibility of coordinating this whole thing. And I think uh, a, a type of a cartel was formed in a way that the, the Chinese railway was given an, an uh, obligation to take all of those provincial operators in one place and unify prices and make this, this process of building infrastructure more harmonized and so on. That is the attempt. You know, the results are mixed because re you, have, you, you probably know that the dynamics between Chinese provinces and Beijing, it's not always smooth. <laughs> and I would say, as for now, the provinces still have upper hand now because they subsidize this thing and that's why they can decide on a lot of things. But nevertheless, Beijing wants to, to, to coordinate this process, to control this process a bit. And uh, because Beijing's goals are much wider than that, you know, the provinces are thinking mostly about the regional development and the train connections. And uh, sometimes they're, of course, you know, cooperating with other countries, other companies abroad and so on, but they're, like, the, the, their vision is understandably more narrow. And the Beijing is vision is, of course, as broad as Eurasia, you know, and uh, Beijing wants to use these trains as, you know, a starting point for a more comprehensive, a deeper cooperation with, you know, Belt and Road countries. So starting with the trains and then trade flows that these trains gener generate attract investments and its investments attract, you know, some coordination when it comes to economic policy, some closer political ties, and so on, so on. So there is this broad vision that, that's, that Beijing wants to push, and it's in a kind of a predicament because the provinces have their own interest, and they pursue this interest, and they're not always in line with what Beijing wants. Yeah? 
So uh, you know the the actual you know, balance here is is changing, but it's it's crucial to understand that if we are talking about cooperation with China when it comes to U-China trains, we're talking about cooperating with both Beijing and the provinces. And among these, those provinces, there are some provinces that are much more important than others. And actually cities, more than provinces itself, because there are mostly cities involved in that. And I already listed the, the big four, which is Chengdu, Chongqing, Zhengzhou, Wuhan. And there are also Suzhou is running trains, Yiwu is, tr is, ru uh, is running trains, there are some smaller connections uh, in, in other places in China, but this big four, those are the most important ones. And one of those is, is uh, building its competitive edge on connections with which, yeah, the Chengdu and Sichuan, which is very important for us. Because other uh, provinces there develop relations with mostly German cities. And Chongqing, Duisburg, is the, the crucial connection for this whole thing to run. And uh, we have a slide, you know, uh, actually a couple of slides on, on Duisburg and also the position of Duisburg. But uh, in a way, if we're talking about, you know, competition on shaping these trade flows, we're not necessarily talking about Chinese provinces or European cities. We are talking about pairs of cities <laughs> on both sides that compete with other pairs or like constellations of those cities. So it's a very complicated matrix, you know, of interests which needs to be taken into account. I'll try to speed up a little bit because we, we have to, we would like to have as much discussion as, 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 as possible. So just shortly about German interest in the project. So first of all, uh, it is quite known factor that actually Germany in the last decade uh, uh, intensified a lot the trade relations with China. Uh, China, it was uh, it was possible because uh, demand for many investment goods in Europe because of the stagnation and eurozone crisis and global financial crisis. There was there was the demand for such goods was uh, stagnant. That's why that's why uh, Germany German ex exporters were looking for some uh, markets outside Europe and China was perfect for such reasons. Uh, and this, this cooperation uh, between Germany and China was, 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 was really good. And actually train connection and, and the great part of this cooperation is uh, cooperation between automobile sectors. Germany right now has a uh, very big share in the uh, Chinese auto market, uh, uh, car market, it's a, uh, it depends on calculation, but it's about 20% share in the market. And that's why uh, train connections is very good supplement for such, for such cooperation because, because of course, uh, car pro producing it's in just in time mode. So, so we need the, the least, uh, it is possible, the, the least uh, warehousing opportunities because, because we don't want to spend, uh, to, 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 to have additional uh, logistic costs. That's why, that's why train could accelerate some things and some activities. Of course, it's not just in time modus mode because it's two weeks, but it's still, it, it makes two economies more integrated. Second thing, uh, Germany expects that it will help also to establish some logistic hubs in uh, Germany. And one of the such leading hubs is uh, Duisburg. Uh, just to show you, show you how it looks. So Duisburg is not, not just only land uh, logistic hub, but it's also river logistic hub. Mm -hmm. Just it operates on the almost uh, whole Germany and the most industrialized part of Europe, so Benelux countries, uh, uh, part of Switzerland and France. And uh, just a, a few basic data. Uh, so it's, it's a region, it's a, it's a very, it shows how, how, how good this kind of connection could be to help for weaker stru structurally region. Because Duisburg in the past, it was uh, a center for uh, coal mining, and that's why that's why uh, they have all already 
uh, they, they have right now some structural problems and logistic hub it's a development some kind of development strategy for for this region so right now uh, it's some general da data it's not only that those 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 uh, those data are, 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 are just the result of uh, ch China-EU connection, but it's also an important driver for growth of the region. So uh, logistical hub uh, grants about 20,000 uh, uh, jobs, for, uh, direct jobs for the people, and 26 indirect jobs, and it generates 3 billion euros. So uh, logis having logistic hub can be very beneficial. Right there. And we have also one another player, which is sometimes, uh, sometimes, which, which interests are not so well recognized in this project. But we, we started to analyze it, and it seems that uh, this China EU railway connections also gets more importance for Russia because we know that Russia has some economic problems for years. Uh, the hopes that that oil prices will go so much and they will pick so much that, that it will grant so much additional budget uh, incomes is, 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 is weaker and weaker. So Russia looks for other, for other sources of uh, incomes. And it seems that uh, train connection is something that is really uh, more and more useful for Russia. First of all, it, it generates a lot of transit incomes. Uh, second, it could be used as political tool for example, to punish Ukraine, as we know that that uh, some trains are not going, a lot of trains are not going through Ukraine. Uh, trains are not going through Ukraine. Uh, Russia also introduced some uh, ban on food products transport through trains. That's why uh, we have some 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 imbalance in this train connection. But the 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 most interesting thing is that we see some growing awareness in Russia that. Uh, having a railway logistic hub could be a, in, an interesting model of growth for Kaliningrad. So they are more and more interested to use it in this way. Okay, um, and now we're going to the, the last point, and that will be a quick wrap-up because we are behind the schedule already. But uh, fortunately, we provided you with most of the context here, and I'll just try to sum up some of the things concerning Poland as a hub. So, as I told you, we are the key transit country, and without the Polish railway network, there will be no business, like economically feasible connections, and this gives us an advantage. But also, what's worth not noting is what we said before, transit is not the real money there. Yeah, the real money comes from distribution, handling, warehousing, all kinds of, you know, uh, externalities, that's how it's called in economics, all of the things that, that these hubs attract, big investments, assembly, and so on, so on. So, uh, well, talking about Poland here, so apart from this transit advantage that I told you that results, most of all from the standard of the infrastructure because this corridor going through Russia, Poland, Belarus, and so on is the most developed. And this Belarus, Belarus, Poland port, you know, this, that's where the, the, the broad gauge, Russian broad gauge is changing to, to the, the standard gauge. This is the, the biggest like, dry port of this kind in whole Europe. And it was always like for for it was like that for decades. It was the, the more major link between Soviet Union and Poland and Europe as a whole. So the the level of infrastructure is, is like it's the biggest drive port in Europe, and this gives us a tremendous advantage. But apart from this infrastructural advantage, there is this you know understandable geographical advantage. Just. Going back to, to Duisburg here, this map here, it's not very visible there, but the idea on behalf of Duisburg is to transport goods from China to Duisburg, and then a lot of those red arrows here point back eastwards. And it really happens now. So some goods are transported from China all the way to Duisburg, and then they're going back to Poland or Czech or Romania, 
all so on. So it's absolutely like from the business perspective, it's ineconomical. <laughs> yeah, it's a waste of money and a waste of time. But it happens because of you know the the, the you know the patterns that the businesses are used to and the uh, regulatory frameworks that this provides. But if these goods like ended up, if these trains ended up in bulk in Poland, for a lot of businesses that operate in Central Europe, South and Southeastern Europe, Balkans, and so on, in Northern Europe, this is the, the most logical point of entry and distribution. So if this train stopped here, they can be easily and fast transported, east, like north and south and so on. So this is the geographical advantage that, there, that, that Poland has, and that's for certain. And uh, I think it's crucial to understand that uh, when it comes to what to how Poland can benefit from this whole thing, I think it's pretty visible now after the after our presentation that the logistics is the the gives you the most of it, yeah, because very technical issue when it comes to tariffs. So tariffs are deducted in a country where you have a custom clearance in the EU, yeah? So if the custom clearance is, is facilitated in Poland, 25% of those taxes stay in Poland. So if they go to Duisburg, this money goes to the German government, yeah? And it goes to Czech Republic, and goes to, it goes to Czech government, so on. So if this train stop here and this custom clearance is facilitated here, the, the value added coming from tariffs stays here. Yeah? But a part of that, 25% of this one billion big number, were the transshipments and distribution. So $250 million annually goes to you know, uh, track companies that deliver these goods throughout Europe to trash treatment companies, custom clearance companies, and so on, a big boost to the Polish logistical sector. Yeah? This is a, the major you know, feed, the major you know, benefit that, that, that we, as Poland, can, uh, can have out of it. Uh, secondly, all of those externalities I was talking about, you know, companies that multinationals that link their production facilities in China and the EU could and do use train connections to link facil like some components that are produced in China and then they're assembled in uh, Europe. Yeah? And if, if those production facilities are close to these endpoints, yeah, then the, the, the tro flow of this parts is smoothest, cheapest, and so on. So in a way, that's how the Chinese provinces think about it. If we have the gateway to Europe, then we'll attract uh, multinationals to invest in our cities. And that's also true on the European side. So this kind of uh, investment attractiveness component is very important here. And thirdly, and uh, I think it's, it should be, should be thought of as the probably the least you know, important part of it is the support for the Polish exporters. You know, I personally would love you know, Polish companies to achieve a level of sophistication that they will produce high value goods in Europe and China and throughout Asia and they will be the main users of these train connections. I really hope for it now, yeah? But as for now, <laughs> They, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but as for now, they're not there, and they're not in those sectors. And if, you know, uh, and if, of course, you know, having an access to, you know, regular and cheap train connections to China gives some opportunities. It's not only about automotives and electronic and so on. Sometimes other goods can be also transported there, including food fast-moving consumer goods and, uh, and clothing, so Polish companies in those sectors can also contribute from that. But what's important here, I, I think with the, the message we'd like to deliver is that if we're talking about a hub, we are talking about the business that surrounds the hub. Yeah? And not necessarily about the Polish exporters, and they will benefit from it, but as a kind of a byproduct yeah, of it. Yeah? I'll more, 
I think that building a hub will be a, the biggest opportunity for Polish logistical sector. And we have the biggest, uh, yeah, the second part of the slide, we have the biggest truck fleet in Europe. We had 300,000 truck drivers and trucks that deliver goods th throughout Europe. We're the biggest. So this is a tremendous advantage. And if the trains ended up in Poland, they can be easily distributed throughout Europe using a very competitive, large, and innovative Polish logistical sector. Yeah. So I think that's one of the, the, the major things there. But as for now, quick statistics. Uh, roughly uh, one quarter of trains end up in uh, Polish terminals, as for now. And, uh, but this represents only about 10, 11% of the value. That's because the, 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 the goods that are transshipped in Poland are of the lower value than the average. Because all of the valuable goods, most of them go straight to Duisburg. And uh, about 70% of the value of goods transported by these trains are transshipped in Duisburg. That's because that's where the big multinationals are, that's where the German automotive makers are, and so on. Uh, these goods can be moved and can be attracted because of a number of, you know, um, uh, of features of Poland as such, which makes us competitive. It's to a to some extent, it's a matter of convincing international businesses, in, including Chinese corporations, Germans, Americans, Koreans, which are also interested in that, and Japanese, that it's more profitable to do that here in Poland because of the costs. You know, handling a container on a Polish terminal is much cheaper than in Germany. We have a you know. Throughout our research, we met tens of Polish entrepreneurs that provide very innovative and good quality logistical services that can be used by these companies there. We have a still a better access to labor force, although this changes rapidly in Poland, but anyways, uh, we still do have it. There's this time-saving component. As I told you, if we stop in Poland, we don't have to go straight to Duisburg and then back. Yeah, and uh, we have this competitiveness of post carriage services. post carriage means going from the railway terminal to the end customer, and here these 300,000 of truck drivers can, you know, kick it. Uh, so a very quick to-do list, a uh, comprehensive system of transports and log logistic services. So if a multinational company or a Chinese railway operator wants to establish a new connection to Europe, it needs to have access to all the kinds of services I talked about. Custom clearance, transshipment, you know, storage, and deliveries in Europe, this should go in a pack. You know, the Polish companies should offer a broad range of services for the, those companies. And only then, if all those parts click in, you know, the, the final product can be delivered. Intermodal connections with my major EU industrial bases. So if we stop in Poland, we need to have a stable and regular connections to all the end clients, yeah? Including track connections and railway connections. Uh, regulatory framework, taxation, custom clearance, the transport regulations, this is a very technical stuff, but some of the transport that goes to Duisburg go there because it's very easy to facilitate business there and do custom clearance and so on. So it's a kind of a low hanging fruit, hopefully, <laughs> to you know, improve regulations as to attract the businesses, yeah? And uh, last but not least, the connectivity with Central, Eastern, but also South and North Europe. So if we don't have uh, large capacity connections between Poland and Czech Republic or Slovakia, or through Gdańsk to to Northern Europe, we will not be able to deliver those goods quickly uh, throughout Europe. So it's not only about East and West, it's mostly probably about North-South connections. I would try to be very brief just to, in the end. So uh, I, would just, I would just tell uh, say that actually we see some synergies between central communication port and, new, uh, and uh, uh, Silk Railroad. We think that actually that that this uh, flow of goods, which is generated by these uh, 
China EU railway connection, it will also uh, generate a uh, flow for passengers because at, at least when we, when we, when we be a hub, for example, for Scandinavian country, for Czech Republic, for part of Germany, for cooperating closely with, Ch for, uh, with China, it will also make, uh, make demand for passenger movement. But we also have to take into account that, that actually, uh, especially according to the initial, uh, initial assumptions of uh, central communication port, there is also a cargo component planned there. So maybe we, 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 we analyzed the, the uh, railway connection could uh, create demand for uh, very new and innovative logistic solutions. For example, we heard already about one. DHL offers such solution that, for example, they, they uh, transport goods from China to Europe by railway and then by plane to South America. And it's more beneficial than just take it by uh, plane from China to South America because of the very uh, wide this uh, Pacific Ocean connection, which is very, very costly. So here there is a lot of place for innovativeness. And maybe just to give you an example, uh, just at, at, the end, and at the end, just to give an example how... Uh, because we also found out that there is there is no one actor in Poland who could coordinate those 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 activities uh, uh, connected to Silk Railroad, and actually Germany is a very example how to do that because this Duisburg uh, port, Duisburg hub, which is actually uh, partly uh, partly. Uh, oh, Par par partial owner of Duisburg is uh, German state. So uh, this Duisburg is so active because they actually do many international initiatives to bring the most of these connections. For example, uh, there was information in the last year that Duisburg got a share in the uh, Great Stone Technological Park or this industrial park. So Wielki uh, Kamin. Uh, so actually it shows that, that Germany is very interested in this topic and they have an actor who coordinates and, and who tries to make some coordinated strategy how to attract the most of these connections. Uh, so just a few question marks uh, in the end because there are also uh, questions which are re related to that, how this uh, connection will develop further. So first of all, uh, actually the question is, if China is interested in consolidating, uh, handling, and uh, making some European, a few European logistic hubs, as they plan it to do in China, because it's an important question. The second, actually, what will be the subsidizing strategy of Chinese government? Because it's also many investors are asking for that, how, how this would work in the long term. Third, uh, what are the prospects for high end industry trade be between China and the EU? Because we know that 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 there are some trade uh, disputes and so on. So so this is also interesting how this demand will be in the future and what is the role of the uh, in the project for the CPK. This is our those were our intuitions, but maybe there will there will be some more ideas how to how to develop it and how to find out more synergies. Thank you very much. Well, it was supposed to be forty minutes lasted for uh, more than an hour. So. Thanks for your patience, and we're looking forward for, for questions for and the, the, the copies, free copies of the report out there and also on the website. And please feel free to contact us with any questions that, that you want to ask here, but we encourage you to ask those questions here now. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to I would like to congratulate you on this work. It's um, I think very important. It's timely for the last five years, so it's good that it comes finally. Because I don't know any comprehensive uh, work. And I'm in Poland concerning the actual connectivity 
practical issues, or questions, opportunities described in a systematic way. So it's very good that uh, the Shroder Studio of Studies and you two gentlemen have uh, <coughs> dedicated your time and effort to prepare this, uh, this work. Uh, I think it uh, should be well studied by different uh, ministries and government agencies um, in Poland and also perhaps uh, business associations because I believe that most of uh, opinions and uh, verbalized or non-verbalized opinions uh, that are circulating in Poland in government and non-government circles are not based on any actual studies but maybe a couple of lines in newspaper magazines or the common sense which can be very different from person to person because we don't have that much in common between ourselves in fact. <clears throat> so it's very good that you have done this work <laughs> and congratulations, congratulations on that. Um, I have some points to, and uh, link those of these questions that I would like to bring to your attention. If you continue, if you plan to continue uh, working on this topic, which I, I, I yeah. think would be very useful, we do, we do, and needed. Uh, one is the the European dimension, also including the EU structures, um, because you have mentioned the number of. Uh, state uh, players, the government players, uh, in this context, which is very right. There's also the European Union, which is also, whatever the European Union is doing, is also, as a matter of fact, the result of the state players' <laughs> efficiency within the EU, right? Um, and there are bigger players than Poland in that game, so it's very important that we also can formulate uh, the ideas for the European Union which would be serving our interest. On April 9th, which is pretty much soon from now, there will be 21st EU-China summit held. And uh, during the summit there will, be, there will be discussions on important uh, matters of uh, EU-China cooperation. There will be also discussions on connectivity. I cannot quote it. <laughs> Let's say I have one of the possible copies of the final document which will be the outcome of this uh, summit. And there maybe is a one point related to what we are talking about. And I don't know how it will be finally formulated, but it says not too much about what we are discussing here, but some important things. Because um, it says that uh, the, the EU and China should foster uh, uh, cooperation on connectivity, and connectivity is meant in a wider sense. The, the economic, but also the social and fiscal and financial and environmental sustainability, cooperation, etc. So the connectivity in the wider aspect. It's also stressed that, and this is very important for you, that there is a transparency uh, rule applied to this. Uh, cooperation development and uh, market-based rules, etc., which we always try to stress as the European Union. Um, and there's one element which may be important, that two sides welcome the agreement, agreement in the framework of EU-China uh, connectivity platform that exists, of course, and has been adopted uh, as a point of common interest between the two sides. So the agreement on the terms of reference for a joint study. So it's a, an option to work on an agreement, but the agreement will make a point of reference for the future joint studies, which is a very diplomatic language. And the studies shall present options for the most suitable railway transportation corridors between the and China. And this is the important one, because if such a study exists, it will be worked out and adopted as the joint EU-China document. So whatever is mentioned as the most suitable EU-China uh, transportation corridor will 
actually be a huge determining factor of who is going to earn money. So I think it would be in the interest of any country, but I'm talking we in Poland and Polish and working Polish government, so we need to do whatever we can to make sure that the result of the studies will point out that what you present in your presentation, Poland is the best corridor. And uh, it's not just a corridor to bring the goods to do its work across the Polish territory on which we earn pennies, uh, but uh, that uh, Poland would be the best, uh, one of the best, because it would never be one, but one of the best uh, hubs for distributing goods in both ways, in fact, because uh, I'll come to that in a moment. So it's very important that um, we uh, come up with such uh, input into this future work that Poland will be pointed out as the most suitable corridor, or one of the most suitable corridors. Because currently, uh, we are actually losing ground. Uh, our position is, was better a few years ago, when I used to work as an ambassador to China, and, uh, and this all happened, started. Right? And I was taking part in the talks to start checking the Woods connection. Uh, that was the first Europe uh, fastest, or one of the best, one of the fastest, one of the future potential best connections uh, by train between uh, Europe and China. And that's why I got the Chengdu uh, honorary citizenship plus for opening the consulate there, which we opened there because of the train connection, mm -hmm. not in Chongqing, for example, which was linked to, like you said, to Duisburg. So Chongqing was sold to Duisburg already. So we saw Chengdu is, needs to be ours. And that's why we helped to open this railway connection and open the consulate there. Now, we didn't follow because uh, at this time our hope was to build a big terminal near Woods, which is the natural place because it's at the crossroads of East and West of Europe and North and South of Europe. Right? There are highways crossing there, and there is a good place for railways, there is land there, and then some people in, in Poland stopped the process, as you know, and uh, it didn't happen. We may have been uh, on the next page, so then maybe we will now, in the sectors close to the government, to reopen this issue. But uh, studies like yours need to be delivered to these people so they understand what is at the stake and how the game is going. Currently, many countries around Poland are making a lot of uh, not so transparent, but also not so hidden efforts to, uh, to, to, to involve China in dropping Poland as the channel, as the corridor, and as the distribution hub. The German, Germans, Austrians, uh, Czechs, Slovaks work to make it to the south, and the Baltic states, uh, including Riga and uh, other possible options, work to go to the north. And all of this is supported by Russia, because that would uh, omit Poland, but also would increase Russia control of this on these channels, including for the Baltic states. Actually, it's quite a lot of traders. I can mention that, that you know this. Already going to the Baltic states, and it's then loaded on the ships, by the ships taken to Rotterdam or Hamburg, and then unloaded, uh, which is a lot of operation, but somehow it's happening, which means just the perfect location of Poland, which is perfect, uh, objectively, is not going to guarantee us success. So we need to work for that, and I think people like uh, you, with this kind of studies, should uh, provide the government with the arguments and knowledge. Second point. Uh, um, I'm a little bit tired because I spent the whole day on the multilateralism and globalist conference earlier today. Uh, but <laughs> I, I'm not sure if you were talking a lot about the question of one-way, two-way traffic because it's getting better because of the German cut production in, uh, in China. So, but uh, initially these trains were going almost uh, full one way, I mean, going full from China to Europe. 
they were actually never going back because it was not worth bringing empty containers. So containers were loaded on the ships, brought back to China, and they were going back from China loaded with the Chinese goods. That has been uh, changed, but that's not what is ours on that. We don't bring a lot of goods from Poland to China, neither we are a logistical hub to collect a lot of goods from other European countries around us, put them on because, and then send to China. Because you said, it's, we will never have a chance to fill trains with the Polish goods, but if it goes through Poland, we owe money on all this additional services that you very well explained in the presentation. One thing which is worth uh, pursuing, I think, uh, mm, and it's not just, it's not necessarily for the study of Scotland, but you may try to, to, to take it into analysis uh, and then give it as a, a suggestion as a result. For something I was doing uh, in 2013-2014, talking to the Chinese provinces. Not, not just uh, uh, Chengdu, I thought, Chengdu, Suzhou, Chengzhou, other places. And in all, the, in all these provinces, I was trying to explain to the Chinese uh, leaders, to the province governors and, and the party secretaries in these provinces, that it is in their interest to increase import from Poland, or import through Poland, so the trains doesn't go empty. Because, uh, again, I didn't know then how much the trains were subsidized, but I was openly talking to the Chinese partners that you can only operate these trains because they are subsidized, but I don't believe, and I, we were of belief that the subsidies come from the central government directly to the, I mean, to the local government to subsidize the trains. And we were saying openly to our Chinese partners, your government is not in position to subsidize it forever. So it can subsidize to start the operations, to get the operations matured, and eventually economically viable and profitable. And, it, and only profitable if you start uh, bring goods the other way, from Europe to China. And of course our goal as Poland will be to fuel the trains as much as possible as the Polish goods, but also to take goods from the other countries, load them in Poland and send it to China. And then openly we were saying we, we, we are not a country who can fuel the trains with the goods, as you it's your dream is, oh, yeah. but it's also my dream, of course, and was always as an ambassador, but realistically we can't. But uh, one of the reasons is that we even have a number of good goods to sell in China, possibly, but we don't, we, our, we, we our companies are not good enough to export them to China, which is partially objective reason, because the entry level to Chinese market is very high and it's very difficult for companies which are small and medium-sized companies. And by small and medium-sized, I mean Polish medium and small and medium-sized companies, not Chinese medium or small and medium-sized companies. So for such companies, the entry level to China is very, very difficult. They, you need to spend a lot of money and wait for the income, for the profits, two, three, four years. So if, if you are this big German company, you can afford it. I mean, you, you put it on the, on the books as the, as, the, as the loss for two, three years, but then you start making profits and you know that these profits are higher than anywhere else in the world because of the size of the market and the margins you make in the market. And so what I was talking to, this is my, my point here for you maybe to think about and study and investigate this, I was telling the Chinese local governments, it's in your interest to help this Polish government. Because normally speaking, this is our job. Our Polish government, Polish diplomats, Polish missions to help the Polish exporters. But we have, we have all the limited instruments of helping them. Why you should help them? You Chinese administration, why you shall help Polish companies to export to China or through Poland to China? Because in this way, you have trains fueled the way from Europe to China, so it starts eventually earning money on the, on the real the market basis. But more importantly, when you bring these goods from Europe, Poland and Europe, to China, and they end up in China in situ, this is not the end of the chain. Then your importing companies in situ one will sell this good, resell this good all over China. And then you will, these companies will make money. <laughs> Even if they make little money on bringing them from Poland, they will make 
steal more money by reselling them to the other provinces of China, which is like a continent, especially in the sense of the number of customers. And the, even you as the local administration earn money because this company is bringing and reselling goods to the other provinces will be paying taxes locally, right? So you will get taxes. So everybody is happy. I mean, everybody is a win-win solution for us who interested us Poland in that. That was never put into any kind of report or suggestions. We have had a lot of work in the embassy. We don't have time to write reports and papers like that. That was my talking to them. But if you explore this, I think it's worth considering for the government to include in the discussions with the Chinese partners. And the last uh, short point is that I wonder who was your research partner in China, because I tried to find this partner, it was at this time impossible. On one hand, everybody was putting a sticker belt and rope on the head in China, because that was uh, the shortest way to get support from any kind of Chinese level government, local or central. You put a sticker uh, belt and rope related, you could get support and money. Right? So anything was, there was this period of uh, explosion of Belt and Road initiatives in China between 2013 and 2015. I was even being invited to be a, a judge in the beauty contest and competitions for the models of Belt and Road. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I suffered much uh, doing that job, but uh, it was ridiculous, right? At the same time, I couldn't find sensible partners in China to do like very solid work on the level of the research of the, of the... i tell you a short story. In 2017, um, not as the Foreign Minister, but as the, as the Poland-China Education Foundation, in which I'm active, a small NGO oh, that we are working with, is um, how to create another public studies in China, in Xi'an uh, University of Foreign Studies. We opened the Polish Literature, Polish Language Studies, but we have also the Polish Research Center that was supposedly focused, supposed to be focused on Polish-China relations. We studied that, and uh, it was a small center, but yes, it was sub established at this university with the support of the provincial level government and party uh, of, uh, of um, Shanxi. But they all focused in, on the theoretical works which are useless. They had the four professors of international relations and they started to write books about Poland to the American relations in 1989, which is a fascinating topic, of course, for the uh, Chinese to study, but it didn't help us with the export. And, uh, so I was trying to convince them, and I even pushed through the provincial level education authorities and central level provincial authorities in 2017 to encourage this research center to do some practical work, work like connectivity, practical aspects of connectivity. So these professors were upset a little bit because they said, oh, we're not specialists on railway or business or something. I said, you don't need to be specialists, you are professor. So you have only to design a book like this, right? And then you say, logistical aspects of the Poland-China railway connections. And you talk to China railways to write this for you. You, you tell them, you order, you have to do the research on the logistical aspects. Then you do the customs, and they do the customs part. Then you talk to Exim Bank, and they say, you write about the financial aspects of financing this kind of cooperation, right? You don't need to write anything. You all together, you professors, you put all these things together and draw the conclusions. And this is your book, and goes under Poland China Research Center in Xi'an because you will be editing this book, you will, you will write the forward and conclusion. So it's your success, work is done by the others, and it will be even free of charge because all the state institutions will pay for it, so you don't even have to spend money. They promised, but they didn't do. So I wonder if you have good partners in China to do the same research on the other side, because that's only good if you have somebody reliable to work on. If not, uh, we can try to help you with partners. But, <coughs> oh, yeah. At least that's the foundation of all here to try to help. So, thank you very much. Can I very quickly yeah. respond to that? Uh, so, 
thanks thank you very much for these comments and uh i found all of those you know very up to a point uh firstly when it comes to the the eu we didn't put it there but we actually were also in brussels and there are people there who are thinking about it hopefully will be a uh, main point in this future document that's about to be produced. One, one point here is that how this whole cooperation is facilitated is also a matter of a debate. So to put it briefly, the Chinese idea on how to coordinate all of those countries is kind of China-centric. So during the first Belt and Road Forum in Beijing, there was an initiative to set up a secretariat in China for China to be the central point to facilitate all of that. And the official EU position was that there are existing multilateral forums to do that. And they should be used as the main platform to you know, develop all of those technical questions that actually constitute the corridors. And what's very important here is that there's only one truly multinational organization that actually deals with that. And this organization is based in Warsaw. <laughs> it's actually one of, I think, the only international organization of that scale that is based in Warsaw. <laughs> and traditionally, the head of it is Polish, and uh, it's at Hoja Street. And I would say 70% of all of what's been done, yeah, us, us, the, yeah, the Organization for Early Cooperation is the name of it. And uh, most of the technicalities that are crucial for this whole thing to happen are negotiated in Poland. Like every two or three months, all of those people come to Poland, to Mariot, and discuss these things. And this is a very serious asset that Poland has here. And as to our knowledge, the official EU position is to conduct all negotiations within this organization. So it's, it's, it's very important. Uh, second thing, the, 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 the way Chinese provinces could, could benefit from actually supporting the imports of goods, I totally agree with that. We, in the report, we describe this circulation of, of not goods, but containers, you know, empty containers and platforms. So all the containers are put on platforms and they're shipped from China to Europe. Most of the flows are from east to west. So the, 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 there are piles of containers stuck up in Poland and Belarus. Also, railway platforms. And you can, you can store the containers or you can ship them by sea. But for the platforms that stuck up in Belarus, you just can't do this. You need to bring them back eastwards, yeah? And somebody's got to pay for that. <laughs> and those are actually Chinese provinces who pay for that. And the, basically the idea is that for the goods that go westwards, the, the, the Chinese provinces earn money on that. But they need to pay for going back. And that's basically where the subsidy is needed. <laughs> so the, the best way to get rid of subsidies is really to support the, the imports and then also there's a distribution within China that these premises could benefit from. And I do totally agree this is a perfectly win-win situation that needs to be, uh, that needs to be developed. And uh, the third point when it comes to the, the, the partners on the Chinese side, we actually found some people that know something about trains are not, are not running trains themselves. And uh, there's one research institute under the NDRC which actually drafted the, the strategy. And uh, I think it's a very good uh, partner to really you know, develop Polish-Chinese dialogue on uh, the, the EU-China relay connections because they're in the knowledge and they're eager to talk. And I would say we were probably the first ones that actually reached them. <laughs> Uh, you know, not to boast too much, probably there are much more people now, but they were very surprised that somebody in Europe is actually thinking about those, those issues. So there's one thing, there are also some scholars that deal with that, but we are all very open to you know, establish new links because most probably there are much more than we've, much more many people that we found. Okay.
Thank you. Last year, we also met some young researchers from China. They were yeah. visiting our institute and also they, they, they looked very prospective. And, yeah, and we, we and yeah, they, conduct bilateral exchanges with them, but the, I think there's a need for like a broader dialogue involving other parties in Poland and in China and we're very, very open to, to participate in that. Just maybe short comment from my side. I, I, I also totally agree about the subsidies and I think uh, proof for that, that, that actually the Chinese side needs to balance it is that actually the prices of the connection back is often uh, lower than the prices of westwards. Uh, but there is also one important actor because probably the, the connection would be wa m much more balanced from almost from now if Russia made some concessions. And that, that is very interesting for us to observe that Russians are more and more engaged in this project, so maybe we will, uh, at some moment they will be interested to, 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 to be more cooperative. And uh, the second thing, it, I, I think uh, you are right. To sum up, actually we have almost everything to be successful in this project, yeah? Very good geographical connection, Małaszewicze, this organization, which is to, uh, which 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 luckily is uh, is in Poland and it's is conduct and 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 is, and this and and uh, its chief director is Polish. Uh, we have a central communication port, which is directly close to Łódź. So actually, it has to have some synergy. So there is uh, most of so, all the, the Polish logistical sector, which we are big uh, fans we have, of. Yeah, two hundred, <laughs> three hundred thousands of logistic companies, and uh, and actually. Uh, the, the strongest position in EU market, so all the assets are on our side. The yeah, rest and the, is, the rest is in our the hands. The Polish railways know? are the second biggest cargo railway operator in Europe, <laughs> so yeah. it's like we have all the cards in our hand. Yeah. And so, so in, the, in, the, in the light of this possible possible developments, they bought the cargo, bought uh, Czech uh, yeah. second uh, biggest Czech cargo railway company, but it's now. <laughs> we didn't mention the whole <laughs> We are very happy that the discussion is so apt today and we would like to invite you to continue the discussion with a glass of wine that can be found on, over there. And now the official part is ended. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.